thanks for joining us today on our Facebook Q&A live talking about navigating pregnancy and new found motherhood during COVID-19. I am Julianne from the Chesapeake Center. I handle most of our outreach and I'm thrilled here to be with two of our team members at Chesapeake to talk with you all things pregnancy, whether you're contemplating pregnancy, whether you're expecting or whether you have welcomed a beautiful baby into the world during this time. We are here to support you and you're welcome to ask any questions um, in the comments and we will do our best to answer all of them. Um, so I wanted to let you know who I'm with today. I'm here with Dr. Carrie Lewis. Um, Dr. Carrie Lewis is a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist at the Chesapeake Center. Um, she completed her medical degree at the University of Kansas School of Medicine, uh, then went on to complete her residency at George Washington University Hospital and her child psychiatry fellowship at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. Dr. Lewis has a long-standing interest in women's mental health interests in particular um, and how to reduce negative symptoms during major life transitions, including pregnancy. So Dr. Lewis, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, and our next guest today is Dr. Chiala Alves. Um, she is a licensed psychologist and neuropsychology postdoctoral fellow at the Chesapeake Center. She has experience in both medical and private practice settings. She received her doctoral degree in clinical psychology with an emphasis in neuropsychology from Albizu University in Florida. She completed her pre-doctoral internship at Mount Washington University Hospital with a focus in pediatric neuropsychology. She's also a mother to a beautiful 15-month-old and is passionate about supporting women who are contemplating pregnancy, expecting, and new moms. So welcome, Dr. Alves. Thank you. Thanks for that. Great introduction. So yes, I, I am a mummy. <laughs> so I'm not going to be lying at all. I'm going to be Thank you both for joining us. Before we get started, um, I wanted to give you the chance to say hello. So starting with Dr. Lewis. Yeah. Welcome everyone uh, to this live Q&A. Um, I'm very gracious and excited to be here with you all today to talk about uh, a very um, important topic um, with our new mommies, uh, our soon-to-be mommies, and our mommies that are in the transition with their pregnancies uh, to give you guys, you know, great information, great resources, and support during this very difficult uh, time. So welcome, 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 and we're glad that you're here. And, uh, welcome everyone. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, I think this is going to be a great outlet for us to share information and also um, just support our community. You know, uh, pregnancy uh, and planning for pregnancy or perinatal period. The perinatal period is quite nerve wracking. So um, when you add a pandemic to that mix, it gets a little bit more complicated. So we could all use a little bit of help. So thank you for being here. And I'm excited to get started. Awesome. Thank you both again. Um, I wanted to, before we jump into your questions, I'll be monitoring your questions below. So again, please comment. Um, no question is a bad question. We are here for anything um, that you might be wondering. But um, Dr. Lewis, I wanted to ask you to start off by telling us a little bit about postpartum depression. Um, we hear a lot about how prevalent postpartum depression is, um, but what does it look like? Um, what are the symptoms? Are there different levels? Can you give us some insight into that? Awesome, yes, great question. Great question to start with. So uh, during the postpartum period, as we actually like to call it, and it's been coined, um, about 85% of women experience some type of mood disturbance. Okay, that's a lot, really, really high number. For most, the symptoms are mild and short-lived. However, for about 10 to 15% of them, they develop into more significant symptoms of depression and anxiety. So postpartum psychiatric illness is typically divided into three categories. Um, the first one is postpartum blues. The second one is postpartum depression. And the third is postpartum psychosis. 
And so a lot of times it's good to envision these disorders on a spectrum um, with postpartum blues being the mildest and then postpartum psychosis being the most severe. For the uh, purposes of this talk today, I'll mainly be focusing on the postpartum depression, but I will segue and talk briefly about postpartum blues because a lot of those symptoms do overlap. So what is postpartum blues? Uh, it appears in about 50 to 85% of women experiencing um, symptoms within the first few weeks after delivery. It's very, very common to have some type of mood disturbance. And so it's really, really important to consider blues as a normal experience following childbirth rather than like a psychiatric illness. A lot of people think of symptoms such as sadness to be associated with postpartum blues, but a lot of times with our mommies that really struggle with postpartum blues, we see mood lability, you know, mood swings, as some of them do call it, tearfulness, anxiety, and irritability. It usually peaks around the fourth and fifth days after delivery, and it may last for a few hours, but it usually remits after a couple weeks. The biggest thing with postpartum blues is that it's not debilitating. Moms are still able to function, they're still able to get up and do the things they need to do. When it starts to become more severe is when we start thinking about, is this postpartum depression? So what is postpartum depression? Postpartum depression essentially are the symptoms that I've just started to describe, but they're more severe, they last longer, and they're debilitating. Postpartum depression usually occurs around the two to third month of postpartum, but it can occur any point after delivery. Some women actually do report milder onset of symptoms during pregnancy. And with postpartum depression, some of the symptoms are essentially indistinguishable from regular depression that any woman might um, uh, experience during any type of issue during her life. So some of the symptoms we see with postpartum depression would be depressed mood, sadness, tearfulness, loss of interest in things, hopelessness, feeling like they can't provide for self or baby, feelings of guilt, um, sleep issues, issues with their energy, poor focus and concentration, and definitely like suicidal thoughts. Also, it's important to note that with postpartum depression, there's significant um, amounts of anxiety that have been associated. Usually it's generalized anxiety is pretty common, but sometimes moms can develop panic attacks. And then there's also a, sub a subset of patients that have um, observed symptoms of postpartum obsessive compulsive disorder, which is when women uh, report disturbing and intrusive thoughts of wanting to harm their infant. They don't have intent, they don't wanna hurt the baby, but they're having these intrusive thoughts. And so that is also something that we've been seeing in studies as well. Thank you. That's very interesting. Yeah. Hormonal changes everything that goes on post pregnancy, during pregnancy. So it's sometimes hard to tell, you know, what what is the time that I should be seeking help? Um, and who should I seek help to? So Dr. Alves, do you have any thoughts on that as well? Sure, yes. I um I think that one of the most important things is to um, for, the, for a mother to just think about her situation and because there are a lot of risk factors that are um, associated with postpartum depression. Um, what we see a lot in the literature is if a mother has already a history of depression or a history of, you know, prenatal anxiety. Um, certainly if a mother has ever experienced um, the baby blues before, right, uh, maternity baby blues, um, like Dr. Lewis mentioned, it's also an indication um, that perhaps in a second pregnancy or third pregnancy um, that that mother might um, experience the same concern, the same problems with baby blues. And it can also indicate that there is an onset of postpartum depression if you are experiencing the baby blues. Um, other things are, you know, just recent uh, stressful life events, uh, loss of a loved one, a pandemic, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, just the uh, maybe loss of a job. You know, now we're we're seeing a lot of these different changes. The world is is changing so drastically. Um, so these these are things to to always be aware of um, to better understand whether you are at a higher risk uh, for developing um, 
postpartum depression and to just distinguish what is depression just because, you know, I am socially isolated um, or, well, I'm exhausted. I haven't slept in three days. Uh, no wonder, you know, <laughs> no wonder you're tired and, and, and um, perhaps experiencing a low mood. Um, other things are, you know, social supports. Um, if a mother is completely alone at home, uh, you know, if it's a single mother or uh, versus a mother that has help from her mother or a neighbor or a partner. Um, so these things will also play a big part in uh, how um, this mother will experience uh, these first few days of motherhood and uh, just postpartum in general. Um, mar marital relationship can also be uh, a big um, it, it, if there are any stressors currently going on in a, in a marital relationship, that can also be a risk factor. Low self-esteem, self any mothers that have had difficulty with self-esteem in the past, um, child care needs and uh, child care stressors, uh, do they have means to um, acquire child care? Um, do they have the financial abilities to, to acquire uh, child care. Are they going to be home? Are they going to be back to work? Uh, how do they feel about staying home? How do they feel about going back to work? So all these things, um, they very much contribute to um, a, as a risk factor for postpartum depression. Um, and believe it or not, we also have been seeing a lot of infant uh, temperament as a, as a risk factor. Um, some babies are a lot easier to care for. Um, some babies sleep better through the night, others not so much. And, you know, it, it can really play uh, a big part in this, in this scene. Um, and there are other things that are not necessarily predictive factors, but they are constantly arising in the literature. Um, so for instance, single marital status or unplanned pregnancies or lower socioeconomic status. Uh, so I think in, in conjunction with, you know, a, um, a presentation of, of depression or a low mood, we also have to take all of these risk, risk factors into consideration, which can either um, make for a poor prognosis or, or a much better prognosis. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, you've touched on so many different variables, um, you know, post-pregnancy that contribute to our mood. And um, I definitely want to jump in later to more questions specific about COVID-19 and this heightened anxiety and uncertainty. Um, so we will be touching on that, but I just want to let you know that we did have our first question roll in. So I just wanted to um, take Kathleen's question. She is wondering, um, you know, at the Chesapeake Center, we are an ADHD center. So we specialize in ADHD. So we know we have a lot of women who are using medication as a form of treatment for ADHD. Um, how do you guide women with ADHD during pregnancy and while nursing once the baby is born? Can they be treated for their ADHD? What are concerns about that? Um, is it safe? Dr. Lewis, what do you... What do you have to say about that? That's actually a very good question. Um, so personally, I have not had a lot of experience with mothers who have ADHD that have continued treatment um, during the phase of pregnancy and uh, postpartum. Um, a lot of my mothers uh, during this time have elected to uh, slowly taper off of their medications. Um, in general, stimulants themselves have a lot of risk factors. Um, that could be cardiac concerns, can lead to blood pressure concerns, and things of that nature. And so that is something that is um, that we would want to consider with a woman that is pregnant, who, when you're pregnant, you know, increased volume of the blood, our blood pressure is arising, there's chances for gestational hypertension. And then if you're on a stimulant that continues to elevate that risk factor, that's a huge concern. So um, I think those are things that we have to be aware of with our new mommies if they want to continue on stimulants. Um, there isn't a lot of research that talks about uh, mommies on stimulants. The information, unfortunately, that we have on pregnancy and new mommies and postpartum is not very vast because it's very 
not very common to test pregnant women <laughs> uh, with medications and trials. And so our information is not very bad, but looking at the situation and talking with this person, you know, I would definitely want to talk to her and I would encourage her to talk to her provider about what are the risks? What are the indications if I do stop my medications? Because as we do know, ADHD comes in various severities. Is this low? Is this, you know, mild? Or is this so severe that I wouldn't be able to function if I'm not on my ADHD medication? This is a huge problem. And so talk to your provider about that. Talk to your provider about the risk. And then as far as postpartum, um, it would be important to then talk about potential withdrawal uh, for baby if mommy is still on the medications during pregnancy. Uh, because although it's not necessarily fatal, there are some risk, uh, there are some risks of withdrawal, such as worsening irritability, anxiety, depressive symptoms coming off of stimulants, especially if, you, especially if you've been on high doses for quite some time. That's actually a very good question. Very, very good question. Yes, yeah, so and we'll talk um, I wanted to, so Genesis, thank you for your question. Um, for women who are trying to conceive during this time, do either of you recommend holding off due to COVID? It seems like we'll be going on for much longer than we imagined. So what are the concerns about getting pregnant during COVID-19 and what do you see there? Dr. Alves, you wanna start that one? Sure, yeah, I'd love to. I actually have um, a lot of friends that are currently facing this dilemma. Just yesterday, a, a colleague of mine um, asked my opinion about this, and it's such a complicated decision to make because of just how unprecedented these times are and how um, every situation differs, right? So for example, a lot of women that are, um, you know, approaching, say, their um, late 30s or um you know they're they're just ready to get pregnant this is a dream they've been wanting to get pregnant or they really want a second or third child and they can't afford to wait much longer um you know that's that's a specific situation and then there are other women who can afford to wait um and they can actually just wait until this you know ride this wave see what how things um go and then reconsider the decision later on um, but the truth is that pregnancy in general is a very nerve-wracking um, experience to go through, right? So I remember that I planned, I, I just planned and planned and planned for my pregnancy. This was my first pregnancy and, um, you know, I wanted a natural birth and I wanted it perhaps at home and there were so many things that I had to prepare for. And then in the end, I got an infection at the hospital and I had to have a C-section. So that was devastating for me. And I could have never imagined that that would have happened. Um, and I think that that's the case for a lot of women, um, especially when they're starting to, uh, they're entering motherhood. For, you know, when, when they're becoming mothers for the first time, everything is so unknown. So it really is very much a personal preference um, in terms of, am I willing to go down this path and am I secure enough and do I have the social support that I need in case something happens and, you know, I get sick or my child gets sick? Um, how am I going to, um, how am I going to cope with that? Am I okay with that? Would I, would I be accepting of, um, you know, any problems that I might have with my child? Um, would I be happier if I have a child um, than if I lose, miss my chance of, of having a baby? This is it. This is the this is it. This is the year. Uh, some women are very career oriented, and they have to make these decisions um, without thinking about other aspects of the world, I guess. Um, and but just to speak a little bit about the risks um, of pregnancy currently. We don't really know much about uh, how COVID affects um, a, a fetus, really. We don't have any long-term uh, research about that. We do know that mothers um, are more susceptible um, to acquiring infections. And when they do, it's a little harder to treat that. Um, we don't know if um, the, the 
children, um, the children that we were able to determine were born with um, the COVID virus. Uh, the, the virus was not actually active um, and it was not determined wh whether that virus was acquired after the child was born or whether it was acquired while the um, child was still in the womb. So it very much is something that unfortunately science cannot answer right now. And uh, that kind of becomes this um, existential question to answer, I guess, for any woman, right? Um, it's very unknown, uh, but so is life, right? So am I going to uh, take a gamble and uh, hope for the best? Um, or am I going to wait it out? Because we don't, really don't know what will happen. Um, but of course, it's important to take precautions. So if you are starting to, if you're planning to get pregnant, or if you are pregnant, um, really, really important to uh, be as safe as possible. Same precautions that you would take if you were not pregnant, washing your hands, keeping a distance from, uh, from others. If someone in your family uh, or in your household is sick, wearing a mask, um, and definitely do not skip any of your uh, prenatal appointments. So you want to be very forthcoming about how you feel uh, with your provider so that they can uh, make sure that they treat you the best way possible if you were to contract um, the, the disease or the virus. Yeah, thank you for you know covering all of that. And so Dee Dee Hendricks um, has a question for us. For women who have suffered from postpartum depression in the past and look to conceive again um, shortly, what types of proactive treatment and or, and or techniques can be implemented to make the transition less troubling um, to kind of get on the front end of it, especially with COVID now being in the mix? Dr. Lewis? So she was saying what proactive, I couldn't hear the second part of what your question was, I apologize. Sure, no worries. Um, she said that she suffered previously from postpartum depression and yeah. to conceive again shortly. So what types of proactive treatment and or techniques can be implemented to make the transition less troubling, um, especially with COVID now in the mix? So what would you, I guess, tell women who yeah. without COVID and then <laughs> now with COVID? So, if the patient does have history of postpartum depression, um, as we had stated earlier, uh, and she might potentially then have history of depression, it's very, very important that she is actually receiving treatment currently. So if she's having history of depressive symptoms, <clears throat> any of the, the symptoms that we named earlier, um, it is very, very important that she's actually, you know, receiving treatment, whether that's with SSRIs or medication management, um, that's very, very important. It's also really, really important that she is following up with a therapist, counselor, someone that she actually is seeing routinely, um, especially during this time, if she's trying to conceive, that's what I'm hearing correctly, she's trying to conceive, but she has history of postpartum depression. It's very, very mm -hmm. important for her to be proactive with therapy um, and making sure that she's seeing a uh, specialist routinely um, for those concerns. I would also say it's really, really important to understand triggers. So if a patient comes in and they're noticing that, you know, when my child or my family does this, this is how I react, or these are things that really, really, you know, make me more anxious, more irritable, expressing that discussing that and then looking for ways to minimize those stressors so that down the line it is as minimal as possible. We can't remove all stress. We're in the middle of a pandemic, but if we can at least identify the triggers currently, I think that would definitely help um, with her down the line when she's actually receiving uh, treatment and she's pregnant and potentially might be having postpartum depression. But I would say definitely being proactive um, is something that's really, really important and getting the services that she needs early on. Um, I don't recommend, uh, usually we don't recommend stopping and starting your medication. So if she does have history of depression and she's been on medications, you know, may, maybe then visiting her provider sooner rather than later to discuss these concerns and, and tell them like, hey, you know, I have history of postpartum or I have history of depression. I was on medication for this short period of time. 
you know, maybe this is something we need to explore now because I am looking, you know, to get pregnant again. So I think that's all very valid. Um, and I would defer as well to my colleague for her thoughts to see what she would like to say. Yes, I, I do Dr. Lewis. Um, it's, it's very important to just be in close contact with your provider. There are a lot of medications that have been studied over and over and over again, like for, for instance, sertraline. Um, I know that there have been so many studies. Um, of course, there are risk factors. There are risk, uh, risks that come with any medication, really. And so that's why it's important um, that you closely, that you discuss this closely with your, with your provider. Um, however, if um, I think that the most important thing to take into consideration is what would be worse, a mother that, you know, is experiencing depressive symptomatology that is so severe that they're not going to be able to care for their child or that they might even put the child at risk, they might put themselves at risk. So there has to be a cost benefit um, sort of um, evaluation there to be to be sure that we're making the best decision for both the mother and also the child. Yes, and I think that, you know, if, if you've gone through that experience where you have had a child and had that episode of postpartum depression, just kind of recognizing yourself and the symptoms that you had before and making sure that, you know, sooner rather than later, that you are in touch with your doctor, that if you're starting to experience any of those symptoms, to just you know reach out um, and get that support. So um, one thing I think with any moms is that period after giving birth where you feel very isolated. Um, so we have another question about you know isolation and new moms um, and how it usually takes a village, but unfortunately, don't a lot of mothers maybe don't have that support system, and especially now. Um, with social distancing, not able to have that face-to-face, in-person support. So how would you advise those um, to really reach out for support or how to take care of yourself when you're feeling isolated? Yeah. Should I answer that? I'll go. I'll go. <laughs> um, so it'd be, I think the secret here is to get, get creative because, you know, these are, uh, very different times. So um, if you are not able to have somebody in the house to help you, perhaps you can reach out to someone who can drop off some meals by your steps, or maybe someone can come over while you're in the bedroom with your child and isolated and, um, and that person just comes in and does the dishes or, you know, like sweeps the floor or does anything um, that would help you on your day to day um, activities because um, the the problem is not so much the social isolation it's just also the exhaustion that the mother might be going through right so um, nowadays thank goodness we have all of these different um, um, ways of, of staying in touch with with others and there is a plethora of um, support groups out there actually that I have found I mean we have a support group that will be starting soon. Um, but uh, there are so many others, and depending on where you are, you might be able uh, to even go to a, a support group in person and they stay further away from one another. That's not, uh, that's not very common, but uh, the number of uh, free groups online is, is really rising. And um, they happen at very, at very varied times. Uh, um, so it's, it's almost like there's no excuse. Um, of course, a mother will be exhausted, but uh, that's something that will really make quite a difference uh, for that mother. Another thing is um, just really going outdoors as much as possible because you do see people and uh, you might see your neighbor. You might not really talk so, um, you know, closely, but you will be able to just um, say hello, and that, that neighbor might say, hey, how are you doing? How's the baby? Can I bring anything? Can I help with anything? So the most important thing during the prenatal period, in my opinion, is just accepting help, reaching out for help. Um, because like you said, it takes a village. It really, 
really takes a village. <laughs> and um, and we don't have that. We live in a very individualist, individualistic society. And um, I think that a lot, of the, a lot of the mothers that are from different cultures also have different expectations or, you know, um, of what their experience will be like after they have a child. So maybe if they can um, plan this ahead. So if someone is actually planning to get pregnant and they're concerned, well, am I going to be all by myself? Maybe talking to a family member and asking, hey, any possibility you can live with me for two months? Um, and then just being proactive. Of course, making sure that that person um, is has not been in, in contact with anyone that has the disease and uh, and being very um, careful about who you're bringing to your home. Um, but asking for help is just, it's, it's just critical. I found I've even needed to just go outside just to wave at a neighbor during this time. So I can only yeah. imagine being a new mom and with all of that, yeah. just getting outside and having those small interactions and getting creative, like you mentioned. Um, even when I was trying to um, post this group or q and I found a lot of mom support groups online. Um, you know, there's really just a lot of resources. So, um, and we hope to be a resource to you as well through this. Um, so thank you, Dr. Alves. Um, one other, we have another question. So we're talking a lot about prenatal and perinatal issues for women in general. But again, our center, we specialize in ADHD. So going back to this focus of ADHD, how does ADHD impact pregnancy and new motherhood? Carrie, Dr. Lewis. Um, I think that when looking at ADHD, um, the diagnosis and the, the, the disorder, it is a neurochemical imbalance in the brain, frontal lobes, as um, Dr. Morris talked about a couple of weeks ago. And so depletion of dopamine, you know, being secreted in the frontal lobes of the brain, which can lead to problems focusing and concentrating. Um, a lot of times we do see similar symptoms with new mommies in pregnancy as well, you know, having issues focusing and concentrating. Um, I think some of the mommies, mommies term it as pregnancy brain. And so a lot of times, some, well, not a lot of times, sometimes we do see worsening of ADHD symptoms with our mommies that are pregnant uh, because of these uh, issues that they had before. So if you're having issues with focus and concentration, if you're having issues with staying on task, you're having issues with organization, executive functioning skills, it, it can become more, more severe when pregnant. Um, and so that's something definitely to consider and weigh in uh, when you are seeking treatment. And I know that we have a number of women and girls that come to our center because our founder, Dr. Nado, has you know dedicated herself to researching this population, and we've learned so much. Um, so we have had a lot of women who are misdiagnosed during their lives, and later in life are starting to realize you know the number one symptom that we hear is just women feeling overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And you know if you've ever felt that way before pregnancy and you know ever considered maybe an adhd diagnosis we know that everything that comes with pregnancy and and new motherhood can really exacerbate some of those symptoms so definitely checking in and and seeing what resources and supports are out there and you know going from there so great answer thank you dr lewis um i also wanted to segue into those moms who are potentially um, going through in vitro fertilization or other fertility treatments? Um, what should they be looking out for hormonal changes that are happening with those treatments? And also, you know, the COVID factor, um, if they do have any comorbid diagnoses. I guess I'll start basically, Dr. Alves, if you want to touch on how do hormones impact us and what is going on, whether it's fertility treatments or whether you're pregnant and <laughs> what does that do to our bodies and how does it explain some of the things that we're feeling? I think it'd be easier to answer how do hormones not impact us? <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. It very much um, 
it, it just touches upon every aspect of our lives as women because um, we go through all these different phases in which we experience this, uh, you know, peaks and valleys in, in hormone um, production and secretion. And that very much has a big impact in a lot of um, either mental health uh, issues or even, you know, just medical uh, issues. In ADHD, that's very much true. Um, that uh, women will experience um, a lot more overwhelm when their demands increase. Um, and part of that is because of the changes in the body. So there are um, there is a difference in the amount of serotonin, dopamine in the brain. There is a difference um, in sleep. I mean, I'm just kind of going through all the different things that will impact because we talk a lot about hormones and for sure uh, there's a, a list of things that we can go through uh, but there's so much more than that that also is playing a part um, so with uh, in vitro fertilization i really would have to actually get back to you because i'm not so sure um that i know that there's that much information about that in in relationship to uh the COVID itself but I do know that there is, you know, certainly a um, a difference in your body because you're going through um, these treatments uh, that will increase a certain level of uh, certain hormones in your body. So um, I think it's just like every other woman who is going through a different phase, um, whether you're trying to get pregnant or you're already pregnant or you just had a baby. Um, all of these are times that you cannot really know what to expect. Um, and so it's important to be closely monitored and with uh, your healthcare provider and also with your OBGYN. Um, the same goes uh, for women that are going through menopause or, um, you know, they're um, premenopausal. Um, um, so it's, it's really important that women are recognized for these issues that are added to their plate um, because of just their biology and their physiology. Um, so, but yeah, I'm going to have to get back to you about fertility in particular because I haven't really uh, read that much about it. But, um, but uh, my guess is that we would have to take it as seriously as we would any other pregnancy, uh, whether it's you know natural or not. And actually, I wanted to mention that you know, parents that are adopting um, are also on the same boat, you know, of just uncertainty. Um, and in addition to um, being concerned about how the child's going to adapt to their household and, you know, how are they going to be as parents? There are so many unknown factors. Um, so I think that, you know, they, it has to be recognized that that's also very, very difficult for, for parents that are trying to adopt. Yes, and I think just being kind to yourself through this transition. Mothers are rock stars and superstars. And we just celebrated Mother's Day last week when we were supposed to have <laughs> this Q&A and immediately remembered it's Mother's Day and of course the timing. Um, so happy Mother's Day to all of our moms out there. You know, whether you are a new mom or expecting all of that, you're going to do great, be kind to yourself and you have so much support around you, you just have to ask for it. Um, my next question goes to Dr. Lewis, uh, more serious mental health conditions. So someone who may be um, diagnosed with bipolar disorder, you know, what medications and what disorders do you really have to go off of to protect your baby during pregnancy? And what, what are the implications of that? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's actually a very, very good question. So. As I've spoken of earlier about the uh, postpartum psychiatric illness, um, we have the different categories and the third category is postpartum psychosis, uh, which definitely can be associated with patients who have history of bipolar disorder and you know issues with mania. Um, and so the way we traditionally treat bipolar disorder is different than how we would treat you know depression, anxiety um, with SSRIs and antidepressants. With bipolar disorder, we actually have to introduce mood stabilizers a lot of the times and or antipsychotics. 
And so when looking at that group of medications, such as uh, when I speak of mood stabilizers, talking about carbamazepine or lithium or Depakote, they definitely have uh, studies that show that they can be toxic to new babies, fetuses, when mommy's pregnant. So it's very, very important to look at those things um, and look at those risk factors associated. For example, with lithium and Depakote in the first trimester, they, um, there are some issues with cardiac issues. You know, there can be limb abnormalities. Spinal bifida is also associated with Depakote, um, which is a serious birth defect uh, in, in, with the infant spine. Um, and there are some studies that talk about with Depakote uh, exposure during pregnancy, there is a decreased IQ risk with uh, the baby as well as they get older. So um, in 2007, the FDA, you know, issued a warning for pregnant mommies um, that linked the drugs like Depakote, lithium, and things like that to a heightened risk of serious birth defects. So that's something we take very seriously. Um, and they are, you know, therefore classed as, uh, category, categorized as class B drugs. So these would be medications that we would definitely encourage our patients if they're on these medications to really seriously sit down with their providers and talk to them about these things because you have to look at, as I said before, the risk versus the benefit. How bad are the symptoms? You know, is this person, they have bipolar disorder, bipolar disorder type one, where their mania gets to the point where they end up in the hospital, where they are, you know, doing things that are really, really high risk and of concern when they're not treated. You know, what do these symptoms look like when they're untreated versus when they are treated? And then really sitting down and talking about the risk that can be associated with treatment during pregnancy, because they are very, very serious. Um, I usually recommend, uh, you know, after you have that assessment and talk with your provider, if you do decide to go the route to stop your mood stabilizers and medications, um, tapering is very, very important. Uh, we also say that after pregnancy, um, right of delivery, even maybe initiating, restarting the mood stabilizer because postpartum psychosis can be associated with our, pa our patients that have bipolar disorder. So you really want to make sure that they're treated. Um, and with our mommies that do have bipolar disorder and they are initiating treatment for postpartum, um, in their postpartum, you know, maybe then talking about the risk of breastfeeding because breastfeeding can be, uh, very, very, it could be a, a, a serious concern with a mother who's on lithium per se, because higher levels can be transmitted to baby and that can have effects on baby as well. So there's a lot that goes into the treatment of bipolar disorder and um, postpartum psychosis that we would want to definitely explore with our patients. Yes, and so it's absolutely possible to go through. It's just about monitoring it really closely and working with your provider. <laughs> Extremely closely. Um, but in making sure that you know our parents are informed, mommy, daddy, they're informed of the risk. Uh, and it, once again, as I said, it's looking at the risks versus the benefits. How severe are these symptoms if this person isn't treated versus what could potentially happen if they are treated? And so I just want to add something to that because I think it would be um, really helpful. So um, when it comes to medication, it, I think a lot of women are very scared when they're pregnant or when they're Know, getting pregnant or breastfeeding in particular and breastfeeding is just um it, it's just such a phenomenal um you know just a food fuel for the child right it really boosts their immune system like no other substance in the world so um so there are some resources that mothers can turn to to um further investigate what the literature says about um, a particular medication. Um, one, one particular that I tend to use a lot, and I, I'd be happy to send the link, Julian, so maybe we can put it in the, um, I guess, on the page where this is going to be. Um, there is a place called, um, 
um, it's actually, it's Infant Risk Center and it's uh, from Texas Tech University. Uh, there's a lot of research that they have done um, on different medications. This is by Dr. Hill um, and he is becoming very, very, um, very known in the community of uh, just, you know, mothers and uh, other resources that are out there for mothers and that are breastfeeding, like, for example, La Leche League. Um, in, in fact, La Leche League has information that comes from um, the Infant Risk Center. Um, and because I think a lot of mothers are so concerned about, um, you know, how the medication is going to affect their mm -hmm. child, that they might be discouraged to uh, breastfeed. And I think the most important thing is to become aware, right? So knowledge is power. Um, if you are aware of, you know, whether the, the risks are high and you definitely want to stay away from that, or um, if the risks are very low, which is usually the case um, when we were talking about uh, mothers with ADHD that are now, you know, have so much added to their plates. Um, a lot of mothers with ADHD will kind of consider their situation, right? They want to know, um, can I change my schedule to accommodate so that I have fewer demands and I can handle all of this without medication? Or is the medication that I'm taking um, a safe dose? Will it affect my baby, right? So there's so many questions. Could I consider a different kind of medication? There are some medications that are non-stimulant, like, uh, like uh, Stratera, for example. So there are, there's a lot of information that's still unknown. So I really always encourage women to talk to not for just not just the pediatrician, um, but also their OBGYNs and um, they are lactation consultants. I was amazed by how much knowledge uh, lactation consultants have. Um, and I think that we're going back to uh, supporting breastfeeding, but uh, for a long time there, um, we were all very um, just weary of, of breastfeeding for many factors um, that we're not going to get into now. But, um, but I think that especially given this new you know, scenario in which we are, um, it's very important for newborns to be breastfed if they can be breastfed. Um, it will possibly protect them much more from um, an infection such as, you know, the COVID virus. Um, so just something to take into consideration. And I think uh, it's, a, it, it's definitely um, a good resource to have. I'm happy to share with you. There are others, there are other resources as well that I can share. Yeah, I would love that. And we can post it on our Facebook. And so you, all of you can, if you follow and like us, you'll be notified when we do post certain resources. So please do so. And we'll be sure to have a follow up here. Um, I do want to thank you both for everything. Um, I wanted to take the time to have one last final thought of what would you tell um, mothers Dr. Alves, as a mother yourself, um, what do you want to tell mothers who are about to go through this? How have the last 15 months been for you? Um, <laughs> what would you like to share? <laughs> um, well, I, I think, you know, being prepared is really important. And I think that uh, the most uh, difficult like the most difficult thing to do is to understand what you can control and what you cannot control, right? So uh, that's where the wisdom comes in. <laughs> that's the hardest part. Um, but in terms of what we're living right now, um, there are a lot of things that we can um, become more aware of if we just ask the right place or the right person. So um, for example, my uh, friend of mine was really concerned that she was going to, she had no choice but to be isolated from her baby. That was, you know, she was so fearful that that was going to be the case. Um, and she, well, she did not have the virus. She just heard that, you know, it was just, everything was just starting and there were people saying that, you know, we don't know if this mother has COVID or not, we have to isolate the baby. So, but now things are becoming a little bit more clear and each state or each district and each hospital has different policies. So just a simple phone call 
and asking, hey, how many people can I bring in? I'm, I'm not, am I going to be alone? Can my husband come? Would my mom be able to come? Um, should I should I worry about being separate from my baby for a very long time? I really want to breastfeed. It's important to me. So if the baby doesn't latch right away, um, what can I do after that? So really ask, 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 um, and just stay informed. But also don't don't over analyze or, or, or get too informed because there's also that, right? I, uh, I think we have so much information that's been thrown at us and we do have to stay up to date so that we can protect ourselves. But at the same time, if it's too much, we may become overly anxious um, and a bit paranoid about certain things. Um, and the calmer we are, um, the better our babies will be. Um, I do know that. Um, and I guess from my personal experience, what I would say is just buckle up. <laughs> it's really going to be quite a ride, but it's going to be amazing and it will be what it will be. Um, so it's, it's really important to just kind of be open to that very moment, right? Mindfulness. Um, it's, um, mindfulness is, is, I guess, we have a group also regularly and for uh, mindfulness, I guess, and uh, uh, I think moms with ADHD is, uh, I'm not sure what the group was, but um, but just talking about mindfulness, I, I, um, I always invite a lot of my clients to practice that on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Because, and I try to do that myself, it's really hard, you know, sometimes I'm having breakfast and all of a sudden baby cries, uh, dad's in the bathroom, grandma's nowhere to be found. So I am going to have a soggy cereal <laughs> to eat later on because now I have to be the baby. But instead of thinking about the fact that I'm going to have an awful breakfast, I can just think about, okay, now I'm here with my baby and, um, whether I know what will happen five minutes from now, which I don't, or uh, whether I'm happy about what happened five minutes before, um, it doesn't really matter because what we have is the here and now. So um, I think that's my advice for women um, that are pregnant, trying to get pregnant, um, or just had a baby. Just try to stay in the moment and enjoy the, the, the special um, event that this is. Thank you so much. I think so many women can resonate with that. So thank you. Dr. Lewis, any final thoughts? What would you like to tell our viewers? Yes, our viewers, uh, <clears throat> this is a very special time. This is a very um, important time, but it's also coupled with a time where we um, have a lot of uncertainty. And so with that being said, it's normal to have good days and not so good days, okay? And as I said before previously, it's very, very important to know what the symptoms are that you should be looking out for. And if it's getting so bad for you that you're not able to get up, you're not able to care for a baby, you are feeling extremely overwhelmed, you know, it's very, very bleak, very, very dark, then after you've done all of your coping skills, reaching out, getting the support from your family, you know, and friends and, 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 and your colleagues, if you feel like it's still not enough, then definitely reaching out to your providers for next steps, which could include medication management, um, especially, especially for our mothers that have history, as we spoke about before, of depression, of anxiety, or postpartum depression. Those people and mothers are at higher risk for having symptoms. So it's very, very important to explore um, all the options that you have available, ask the questions, ask the hard questions. Unfortunately, as I said before, there's not a lot of data with mommies and medications because we're just not testing uh, a lot of mommies with medications. Um, so, but the information that we do have uh, it does seem very favorable for certain types of medications as before, like I said, SSRIs, TCA, those types of antidepressants, we have um, really good results with for treatment of postpartum depression. 
if you want to breastfeed, there are medications within those subcategories that have very low transmission rates to babies that you could talk to your doctors about. So there are options for treatment if the symptoms are getting very, very severe and, you're, and you need that additional help with, in addition to your therapy, in addition to um, the coping skills and things that you're setting for, you do need that added help. Um, so I think that's just very important to note, very, very important to note. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. And I want to thank everybody who has been watching with us and asking your questions. I'm thrilled to be with Dr. Alves and Dr. Lewis. So thank you both for taking your time this Sunday um, to share your wisdom um, with all of us. And I do want to let our viewers know that we do have a number of free support groups right now. We are absolutely going to continue to share all of those resources on our Facebook page. So be sure to like us, follow us. Um, that's the way that you will receive the most up-to-date information. You're welcome to if you weren't able to ask your question or if you watch this after the fact um, and you would love to ask a question, um, you can comment on our live post or you can email me directly. Uh, my email is communications at chesapeakeadd.com. But we, again, thank you for tuning in. And if you have any suggestions for future topics, let us know. But thanks again. This has been great. It's been awesome. Thank you so thank much, Julianne. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.